himself, uh, wanted to introduce uh, Sam Coleman, who has been the originator and the chairman of these events for the past several years, never failing to come up with uh, a list of presenters uh, to make uh, an interesting uh, evening uh, uh, for us. Uh, and uh, you continue to do so uh, each season. Uh, and without any further ado, I want to introduce Sam uh, to introduce our speaker. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Because yes. I, lost, I lost the camera, but I'll find it. But now at least you can hear me. That's good. Uh, yes. I, I'd like to introduce the speaker. I'd like to just make a, a brief comment about the series of books that we've been having. Without me trying to, uh, quite a few of the books that we've been reviewing have been dealing with uh, Holocaust, post-Holocaust, war, World War II, American Jews. And I have become, I didn't grow up here. I came to this country at 21, but I was always an admirer of the DR and American Jews worshipped and still do and were FDR. And I have become so disappointed. The more I learn, the more I'm disappointed what was going on. This book tells me, usually the excuse was that FDR would have liked to do more, but he couldn't because of the State Department, because of the laws, because of whatever. And now I find out that he didn't even do what he could have done. It, it, it's a terrible thing, and, but we have to learn history. So this is just a contribution to, to history, and we have to draw some conclusions. I don't know what the conclusions have to be. It's the past. But we, we, we as Jews have, been, have to be vigilant and not accept um, the legends especially of people who are alive. We have to try to get people to act properly and not rely that they would have loved to do more, but they couldn't, etc. Anyhow, so let history take its place. So Avi, I am looking forward to a very interesting evening and I hope we all, uh, we have just looking forward to hearing you. And David at the end will tell us about the future um, sessions that we have scheduled and we hope to see all of you and more more of us to participate in these uh, very interesting book reviews. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Avi Friedman. To me, it was Friedman, but it's, it's Friedman. So nice to see you, Avi. Be well. Actually, it is Friedman. It's Polish, but the it, the it is a Y, so we, we our family pronounce it Friedman. Okay. That's it. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, my wife and I are from Baltimore. We've been here now five years and uh, we've got to know a number of people here and really enjoy coming here. And we're happy that we're going to find a way of coming down Wednesday night and uh, being here for, uh, what is it, to, to see everybody and be involved with everybody. Again. Can everybody hear me? Can people hear me? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Okay. Um, you took a little bit of my thunder, Sam. Oh, I'm sorry. It's all right. I, uh, I'm a, uh, I'm a child of survivors. I was born in DP camp after the war. My parents are from Poland, and I was born in Germany after the war. And uh, in 1952 or 1950, my family came over on a boat, and uh, and became we became Americans. And one of the things that was very special about that is we, my parents loved being American. We always celebrated Thanksgiving. Flags are out on the 4th of July, on Memorial Day. We were, were part of that whole thing. And my parents were caught up in worshiping FDR. That's because they felt he, because the Americans liberated them or part of the liberation of them, they, uh, that you know, FDR was the person who was most involved with it. And I have a mother-in-law who was very, was very liberal and she loved FDR. There was nothing he could do that was wrong. 
And so that's how I was brought up. America was wonderful. America helped the Jews as much as they could. And then when I got into graduate school in 1970, I was out in the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And the next year, there was a, a historian there who decided to just do a few presentations at the Hillel. His name was David Wyman. David Wyman, and this is 1971, had a lecture. And during the lecture, what he said was, America didn't do what it could have done during the war. What America did was that it built up paper walls to prevent Jews from coming in. The State Department and other people who were involved in immigration didn't even allow the, the quota that they had of people to come in. They found every reason to make it more and more difficult. For example, to come in if you had a relative still staying in Germany. They said, well, we can't have you come because maybe they'll do something with them and force you to become a spy. So, you know, things like that. Uh, so it made it very, very difficult. They hardly used over the 10 years that they, that they had from the, from the mid thirties until the end of the war, over 200,000 slots that could have been filled were not filled. And I said to myself, no, no, this can't be true. And then the, two years later, uh, a book came out and uh, it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't Wyman's book. Wyman's book came out in 84. It was, uh, it was called uh, The Abandonment of the Jews. But before that, other books were coming out and the story was coming out. But there were always people who would find a reason to excuse it is, you know, somebody said, oh, it was, the, uh, it was the State Department who did it. Or no, it was, hands were tied. They couldn't do it because uh, they didn't want to take away from the war effort, that kind of stuff. And so it was, there was always an excuse. And until Wyman's book came out in 84, the excuses fell away and people began to understand that something else was going on. I have my goal tonight. I have I have three goals. Uh, one of the the main one is to get you to read the book. Because unless you look at it and see all the facts, it's going to be hard to digest. In fact, I can I can't give you a lot of facts tonight. I just can go through a few things. Here's here's what my book looks like. I can't I don't know if you can see it or not because it goes in and out. Uh, but in it. I have I have all the uh, I have the pages marked. I have a whole bunch of marked pages here because every time I saw something that I needed to remember, I put a little marking on it. There's probably 50 or 60 of these little of these little things there. And so uh, I said I I called my brother. I have a twin brother, and I said to him, I have a book you have to read. So he re he read it within he got it in within a few days. He called me to say he can't believe it. Because this is something he wasn't really involved in thinking about. But it really disturbed him as it disturbed me. And as it may disturb whoever else reads the book. But uh, the, so the goal is for me, I want you to read the book. I want you to be able to see the different opinion and to open yourself up to understanding that the United States hasn't always been a major friend of Jews, okay? Uh, three things I'm going to talk about tonight is one is the history of betrayal. Also, it's kind of like a, this book was like a psychological study of Stephen Weiss. And also the book is also a warning. And those are the things I like to, uh, to kind of uh, discuss tonight. History of betrayal. It doesn't start during the war. It starts around 10 years before the war. During that time, uh, or actually, let's say after, after the First World War, 
the United States became much more isolationist. And so they didn't like uh, immigrants to begin with, and they certainly didn't like Eastern European and Jewish immigrants. They also didn't like Japanese and, uh, and Asian, uh, Asian immigrants. And it's one thing that uh, in the back of your mind, you have to think about what really causes uh, it's, it's hard to say, but uh, Raphael Medoff, uh has a, clearly has found stuff that says that he believes that FDR was an anti-Semite. Now, to, to, to one of the reasons for this is that he wrote a number of times about uh, immigrants. He didn't like immigrants who weren't uh, of the same blood as him. Those are some of the terms he used. He didn't like Asians because they were very different and wouldn't assimilate. And he wasn't too thrilled about Jews because they also were not the assimilating ones. I mean, things like uh, uh, some of the German Jews who had been there for a while and all that, he wasn't concerned about them because they were, that was a different class of people. But the people who were coming in uh, in the early 1900s uh, in the Lower East Side of New York and people immigrating there he wasn't too thrilled by them. In fact, he had a very interesting uh, perspective on it. He wrote in uh, one of his columns that he wrote for a Georgian uh, newspaper after he had run for vice president. So he wasn't just some schlub who was writing. He was someone who people knew. He was a, he, he was a political figure. He said, when you had immigrants like this, like the Japanese and probably like the Jews, what you need to do is spread them out. Don't have them all congregate in one place. You need to spread them out. In fact, he had a meeting with Winston Churchill in the early 40s, and he, he decided that what he needed to do was the best way to settle the Jewish question, he said, was that he should they should all be, only a few people should be let in and they should be spread out all over the place four or five families here, four or five families there, like in Hyde Park where he lived. Let's, we, they allowed four or five families there in different play, parts of, of Georgia, just a few few people there because he didn't want them to get together and congregate. He also wasn't too thrilled about intermarriage between Jews or between Asians. He didn't want the bloods to mix. And the thing is, this wasn't just his idea. There's, there was a whole eugenics idea during the during that part of the uh, of the century and so uh and that was also the nazi idea that people were better or worse because of their uh their heritage and so uh and he wasn't uh what is it fdr was not immune from anti anti-semitism he was on the uh the board of directors of harvard university in the, in the early 30s when they decided they'd put in a quota on Jews. He was very happy with that. So but that's another thing. But what, but it wasn't just Jews. He was a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. He wasn't too thrilled about, uh, about Irish Catholics either. He just didn't want people to be other than that. He thought Americans were lost. That's what they, that was, that was the best kind of American. So, uh, but in terms of the history, of what was going on. Uh, during that time, as I said before, they were trying to limit immigration. First of all, they were, it was isolationist, but they also didn't want the wrong type of people to come in. So with that in mind, they began to limit and limit Eastern European Jewish uh, immigration under the, um, under the uh, different protocols that they had. Uh, then Kristallnacht happened. And during, when that happened, uh, Stephen Weiss and the other leaders of the Jewish communities uh, went to him and asked him and asked the State Department, say something about Kristallnacht. Say something. France said something. England said something. But they were trying during mo most of the 30s to have a good relationship with uh, with Hitler and with Germany. So what he said was, 
What happened is unbelievable. That was it. He didn't mention Nazis. He didn't mention Jews. That was, that was his whole thing. Just after Kristallnacht, the, uh, the British opened up their, their uh, what is it, their country to the kinder transport. 20,000 Jewish kids were able to come over to England. And also 15,000 older, older girls came in as nannies. So there were 25, there were 35,000 people who were saved. They tried to do the same thing in America. And they said, oh no, no, we don't, we don't want that. We don't need that at all. And one of the comments was, these babies are cute, but they grow into older Jews. They grow into bigger Jews. During that time, there was a conference. The, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to, there was a conference, Avia, the Avian Conference. And they, were, they decided a number of countries, France, Germany, America, uh, trying to figure out, this is in the, in the early 30s, what are we gonna do with the Jews? How can we help them? And not one of the countries said that they would accept any refugees. And this was a time when German Jews could be refugees. They tried leaving. This is the time of the uh, St. Louis ship, you know, the ship of fools, St. Louis ship. Only two countries said that they would take Jews. One was the Dominican Republic, and one was uh, the Virgin Islands. Well, uh, America went and caused neither of them to accept any Jews. I think they, a few people came to the Dominican Republic, but they oh, said no. they, would open up, they would open up for 100,000, but they just got a couple of thousand. And they stopped the Virgin Islands from accepting anybody because the Virgin Islands is, in, is a U.S. territory or something, it was at that point. So nowhere in the world, no one wanted to take in the Jews. Okay. And when Hitler, Machimo, saw that, and he realized no one wanted the Jews, that was another nail in the coffin of the Jews. He says, well, no one's going to object to whatever we do. Okay. Um, but a few years later, when they were bombing Britain, America opened its doors to young British children to come in for uh, what is it to protect them from the blitz? So that that's kind of what was what was happening. The whole I, the whole uh, what is a system was working against Jews coming into America, Jews being protected, and also mm. at the time uh, America did not did nothing. U.S. did nothing to help uh, open up Palestine at that point. They were they agreed with Britain. Same kind of pressure because they didn't want the Arabs to have an uprising, even though they had uprisings for other reasons. They didn't want them, so they also closed off Palestine to uh, to Jews. So that was that was the main that was the main problem. Okay. So this the the betrayal was uh, was something that going on from the mid thirties. Let's say it still does. I just have to listen. That's I'm sorry. Was there a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Could you mute yourself? Uh, so there was a. Uh... No, it didn't make a difference. <laughs> so there were. Uh, there it's was. Very clear. Just continue. Yeah, if if you could mute yourself, so I don't, so it doesn't disturb the other people from hearing me. You know how to mute yourself. Uh, I don't know. I I I like to hear it. <laughs> It was you. very clear before. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what we we're talking about actually was the uh, one of the reasons that the Jews weren't allowed in is because they weren't considered allies. They didn't have a country. The French could come in. The uh, Italians come in, the British come in, but the Jews, they, they couldn't because why would they, what did it matter? 
they weren't they weren't really allies like other like other countries were. Okay. Um, let me just see. It's also fuzzy the picture. Most, no, that's okay. Yeah, they're not dealing with the camera, right? I thought maybe yes, I could. Mute, mute just go, please. Is there a host on here? The host can mute everything. Okay, sorry. Um, so that's, we're, de we're dealing specifically with, uh, <laughs> with this history of betrayal. Let me go through the one major thing of this, okay? In August of, uh, in August of 1942, the American consulate in Geneva received a request from someone named Gerhard Ruckner. He was the Swedish, Swedish representative of the World Jewish Congress. He, the official that took this request, uh, they, he came and wanted to speak with them. He said he was very agitated and very upset. And what he did, what Gerhard Rigner did, was that he, he described that a German industrialist, his, whose name it turns out was Eduard Schulte. Edward Schulte was a uh, CEO of a major mining corporation that supplied a lot of materials to the German war effort. And with a few weeks before that, this was in 1942, a few weeks before that, he, um, he met with Himmler. And Himmler described to him uh, in a town called Oswegen or something like that, I can't, I don't know mm -hmm. the pronunciation, that it's we know now as Auschwitz, that he was there and he, he tr they tried something new there. They gassed 40, 450 Jews in one of the barracks. And he told this to the guy, he says, and this is what we're going to do throughout Europe. So this industrialist, uh, Edward Schulte, went and he told Rigner, and he told Rigner to tell people everywhere about this. Because he expected that if the people in America heard about this, if the Jews heard about it, they would be able to use their, their influence in America and around the world to say something to, uh, to Hitler, kind of say, you can't do this, this is not right. What happened? Uh, the the, con the, the uh, council in Geneva went and sent this information to the State Department they were all with, instructions, yeah. with instructions that it be sent, the, the stuff also be sent to Dr. Stephen Weiss, Rabbi Weiss because he was the head of most of the Jewish organizations. He is head of American Jewish Committee, American Jewish Congress, the World Zionist Organization. He was the head of a lot of stuff. And what, uh, what happened was that the State Department sat on it for three months. They said, well, we don't, we're not sure it's true, but they knew it was true so from a really good source. But they sat on it because they were afraid that if people knew about it, there'd be a lot of pressure on the president to do that. But what happened was the counselor, the council in uh, in Geneva also sent it to England with instructions to get it to Rabbi Weiss. So Rabbi Weiss found out about it, not from an American, but from the British. And the moment he heard about it, he was very upset. He called up uh, the people in the State Department. He says, well, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? He said, they told him to keep quiet. <laughs> keep quiet. That's, the, that's what the whole thing is. Keep quiet because we don't want to ruffle their feathers. We're going to work on it. We're not sure about it yet. We'll find out more. We want verification. So for three months, they sat on it. And they didn't do a thing. So that's part of the history of the betrayal that uh, that he that he had. That this is just one of the times that they went and they completely. But we knew the State Department was loaded with anti-Semitism. Always is. Yeah, uh, that's what we were saying before. That the State Department at that time was loaded with, I think, Breckenridge Long and some of the people who were there. And they were what, well known. 
and what uh, and what uh, what Rabbi Weiss was doing was he was holding off. He was holding off. He knew all of this stuff. And the thing is, at that point, they hadn't heard of the Wansi conference that had taken place earlier that year. At the Wansi conference, they decided how many, they found out how many Jews they were and how were they going to kill them. There was a plan for the final solution at that conference. In fact, a few, uh, a few days after the Wansi conference, Hitler had a major speech where he told everybody he was going to annihilate the Jews. They had plans and everything to annihilate the Jews. Now, this was a, this was a public speech. And the, uh, the allies heard it. They know they were monitoring the stuff that was going on there. But they didn't somehow connect the dots that he says he has a plan to redo this. And when they hear about how the plan was going to be carried out, they didn't do very much. Finally, after the three months, they verified it with, uh, with uh, Rabbi Weiss. And Rabbi Weiss immediately went and he uh, decided to have a press conference. And at the press conference, he told about this this thing and how they were trying to kill all, kill the Jews. Now this is in 42. From 39 when they first went through uh, through until 42, they didn't need gas chambers. They were going town by town by town, taking the people out, digging their grave, and they were killing them. Mm -hmm. In fact, the majority of Jews were killed during the Holocaust were killed by bullets, mm -hmm. were killed by these unsigned troops, these groups that were running around uh, Poland and, uh, and Russia, Western Russia. And they're the ones who, most of them were killed. You've heard of Baba Yar, you've heard of other places like that. That's where most of the Jews in the Holocaust were killed. We know about Auschwitz, we know about Dachau, we know about Helmo, we know about Treblinka. Because they were major factors, they made the things that made, but just as many people but not more were outside of it. And they knew it. They were getting reports all the time of the atrocities that were going on, but no one was working on it. No one seemed to care. In fact, I, I have a quote here that uh, during only five reporters attended Rabbi Weiss's press conference. Excuse me, there are people who are talking. Can we get them quiet? Can, is there no way to, is there no host here? Is there no host? There's somebody, excuse me, there's somebody who is talking. Please stop that. And mute yourself. You're disturbing everybody else. Marsha mm -hmm. and, and Ada, please, you have to turn the mute button on. You have to, you have to turn off the microphone. All righty. Uh, Thank you. Okay, at this press conference, the New York Times didn't come. The Washington Post didn't come. Uh, that and when they, they heard about it in the wire services, and they buried the announcement of this, uh, of this, uh, the, uh, the, uh, of this proposal of this, what they re re received from, uh, uh, from, uh, what is his name, uh, Gerhard Reigner. They his what what he they they buried it into the back pages, and there's. There's books about how the New York Times buried all the information too. Not only that, Time and Newsweek, Newsweek ignored the news entirely. Those were the major news outlets that people had. And, uh, and the State Department didn't uh, make any comment about it. And what we call the mainstream media, they were offered this scoop and no one took it because no one seemed to care about what was happening to the Jews. That's the, that, that's it. So uh, that's one of the major things that happened in terms of betrayal. Let's talk about a couple of other things that, that were there. Uh, there was a group called the Bergson Group. Bergson's real name was uh, Hillel uh, Cook. 
He was he was Jewish. He came in from Israel, was Palestine then, and was working with Zeb Jablonski to uh, to develop a Jewish army. But in 1940, when the uh, when the Germans invaded Poland and they heard about what was going on there, uh, they they switched all. And this was after the Jabotinsky, I'm sorry, Jabotinsky, after, after he uh, died, uh, they went and they did all of their efforts to try to go and save the Jews. They developed different committees to try to publicize what was going on. And, th and what was going on was that Stephen Weiss wasn't happy about this because they were taking away his leadership. He, in fact, went up to uh, Bergson one day, he says, who elected you to do this? And he said, Bergson said, who elected you? Your self-appointed groups, which it, we still have a lot of these kinds of groups in America uh, where you have all these presidents of organizations of, and they go and they develop a, a, uh, a committee of presidents. Then they have the president of the presidents and they feel like they're the ones who, uh, who are speaking for the uh, Jewish community. Right now we have the president of the uh, of the uh, committee of presidents, who is someone who's anti-Zionist. There's uh, things about that in the papers of, a few months ago. So just like that, even though uh, Weiss all worked, always worked very, very hard for the Jewish people, somehow he, because people, he didn't want people to take away from his power. And so that uh, he didn't like anybody to challenge his leadership. In 1934, another group of people that called themselves uh, the Brooklyn Jewish uh, Dem Democracy. Uh, they tried to do various things to save Jews. And he was so much against it that he, he spoke in, in, the, uh, in his temple, the, uh, the major reform temple that he had against them and tried to get turn people against them. He did. Uh, he, he called them, uh, he just called them names and told them they're trying to uh, they were like anarchists and trying to undo what was going on in America. The one thing that people were very concerned about uh, was that they didn't want uh, the Jews, they wanted them to be quiet. Why? Because they were afraid that the latent anti-Semitism, sometimes not that latent, would be aroused by them. When Hitler came into power, uh, Jews boycotted, began to boycott Jewish, uh, German products. And it was uh, a major thing. The government didn't want that to happen. And so they, uh, they did things like they, you have, you have to put down the country of where things are, are, are manufactured onto the products. And what they, the, the uh, what is it? The United States allowed was instead of putting down Germany, they put on other parts of Germany that people wouldn't know in Germany. Not like Bavaria, but they say, another name of a, of a city or another name of a, a region so that people wouldn't know it was, a, it was German made. So they worked against that, the, uh, the, uh, the government worked against that. Um, but the other group that uh, really uh, drove uh, Stephen Weiss crazy was the Bergson group because they did things out in the open. They didn't want to hide, uh, you know, keep quiet and all that kind of stuff. Uh, whereas Stephen Weiss worked like most many, many Jewish predecessors when they were working with the governments would, you know, they'd, uh, they'd handle a little bit. They'd be quiet, they'd work behind the scenes, they'd try to be diplomatic. Uh, Bergson was not that way. And uh, Weiss was very upset about that because he didn't want to have anybody uh, can complain about FDR. Weiss loved FDR. Uh, he didn't vote for him the first time. He voted for, for Norman Thomas, he voted for, for a communist, a socialist. But when uh, FDR had the New Deal, he thought that was the most wonderful thing ever. And he, and he supported him and he worked as hard as he could to get him continue to be elected. And uh, FDR, appreciated that and let him be, let him feel like he was in the inner circle. He would call him Steve. He, uh, 
we would uh, see him every once in a while. It was like intermittent reinforcement. He would allow him to talk to him a little bit, uh, speak to him directly, uh, come to a little conference here, a little thing there, but he never did anything for him. He always found a reason why he couldn't and always tried to put him off. Um, and so the Berkson group went and there's a whole history of what they did. They, they went and they uh, did ads in the New York Times that were against what was going on in Germany and asking our government, how come you're not doing something about it? Uh, also, they had a, uh, these special, uh, what do you call it, in Madison Square Garden, they had special programs. 20,000 people came to them. Uh, they were major, major uh, events trying to get people to uh, get on the side of helping the Jewish refugees, helping the Jews who were uh, being, uh, who, who were having problems in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Yeah, but they, uh, what is it? Stephen Weiss and his group were very, very much against it because they didn't want to rock the boat. They didn't want to enhance anti-Semitism. That was their big fear. And then the big thing that you may have heard about is that the Bergson group went and they got around 500 Orthodox rabbis to come into Washington between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and to march down, march through Washington to the White House and to present a petition to get them to develop a, uh, a war refugee board, something to help the refugees. And when they, Stephen Weiss didn't want that to happen, he told the people in uh, the government not to get involved with them, not to even see them because they were just un, kind of un-American. Look at them with their long coats and their long beards. They shouldn't, you know, don't even bother. In fact, what happened was, uh, I think the vice president came out to just uh, get their petition, but the president was snuck out the back of the, um, the White House. He was there, there was nothing he was gonna be doing that day, but he decided he was not gonna not even meet a small group of them to accept the petition on the recommendation of Stephen Weiss. He didn't want this other group to be involved with it. But what happened was that this raised such a row in the, uh, in the administration among some of the other uh, people there that something is going to, what had to happen. So there were a number of congressmen and senators who decided they want to develop something called the War Refugee Board, W-R-B, and to help do something uh, with the refugees. And uh, at the same time, there were a number of people who were, we we'll call them whistleblowers. They were in the State Department and they came to uh, the Treasury. Morgenthau, Morgenthau was in the Treasury, Treasury Secretary there. And they developed a report to show how they systematically prevented Jews from coming into America. And they systematically prevented any kind of rescue efforts. I mean, they had empty ships going over to our ships going over to Europe with supplies and they didn't have any room to when they were bringing the empty ships back to America to to have any Jews on them. They did they did nothing to the minimum uh, to to help people then. Well, because of of this uh, these whistleblowers and other things, the president finally developed something called the War Refugee Board in the, in for in uh, mid 40s in 44. And even though it didn't do a lot, he was able to save over 200,000 Jews during that time. Another thing in terms of betrayal is a very famous controversy. And that's a controversy of bombing Auschwitz, the, the, the Auschwitz and the rail lines going to Auschwitz. It was, <coughs> they continued to say they couldn't do it because they didn't want to take away from the war effort. You know, I, my parents kind of said it wouldn't, it would have been nice if uh, someone came, but they were told uh, afterwards, oh, they couldn't because they couldn't take away anything from winning the war. The best thing to save the Jews was to win the war. Well, of course, winning the wars are important, but they could have done some stuff in the meantime. What came 
what came out later was that uh, planes went right over Auschwitz because five miles up were, were some oil uh, depots that they had to go and they destroyed. Five miles to the left, there was a, there, were, there were more things like that. Uh, they, were, they were able to uh, destroy other materials, but they didn't, they didn't drop a bomb on the crematoria. They didn't do anything with the rail lines. They said, well, we, if, if we bombed the rail line, they'd just be, they'd be able to fix it. They said, well, what about the bridges? Bomb the bridges. They can't fix the bridges that fast. Because every day, thousands of Jews, especially in the last year, Hungarian Jews, were coming in every single day just to be killed. If they would have, every day that they didn't have the, uh, the rail lines going, would have been another 10,000 Jews saved. And so uh, they didn't do that. And in the end, afterwards, people have done various uh, reviews of what happened. And they said, hey, all those excuses are not right. For example, uh, they went and the, the government went and took out a, took a hundred bombers and went to Warsaw and dropped a lot of munitions, and food and all, the, all this kind of stuff to help the Polish home army because they were, uh, they were, there was an uprising for them. They did this knowing that it wouldn't matter, that they were not going to help. They were going to be defeated anyways. But they did it because the Polish uh, government in exile were allies. And again, the Jews were not allies. So those are three of the things that... Uh, that I think are important to know about the, the history. Let's think about the psychological thing that was going on. Here we have someone who for years was a major leader of the Jewish, um, Jewish community, Rabbi Weiss. He was involved in almost every major organization and he did wonderful things. He was able to, uh, to organize a number of kinds, a number of things during during those years, the early years. Uh, he did worry about the refugees. He did worry about things that are going on in different parts of the world with Jews. But when he got involved with FDR, it changed because he was very much involved with him, felt he was a, a friend of his, when in fact, what FDR was doing was playing him around, playing him a lot. Because what he would do is intermittently, he'd have to come, as I said before, and he'd call him by his first name. He made him think he was part of the, the inner circle, but he wasn't part of the inner circle because he didn't have any influence at all. He couldn't even get him to make a statement about crystal meth. He couldn't get him to, uh, to uh, what is it, to help with the boycott. He couldn't get him to even do the War Refugee Board until he was forced to do it because he was about to be embarrassed because the, the Congress is going to, to uh, do something with that. So uh, what, what we have here is a person who, uh, what, I, what do they call them, a psychopath? It was someone who was so much involved with the leader that he didn't even uh, think about what the results would be what he really could have done, but he was told, keep quiet, keep quiet. And it wasn't, I mean, the whole group there was told to be quiet. Even Eleanor Roosevelt told uh, her Jewish friends that they should, they should calm down and keep quiet because they don't want to uh, ro you know, rally people with anti-Semitism. And she was a major human rights person. So that was just what was going on there. And that's what they told them. And that's, kind of what we grew up with. I don't know about you, but my parents used to say, Zashkil, if there was a problem and I want to, let's say, go to the principal in the school or something, he said, Zashkil, don't, uh, don't rock the boat. And that, that's something we can, that's, that's something we can learn. Wanted to go talk a little bit about our warning, the warning, because there was a third thing I wanted to, to mention. We saw what happened when people think that they're, they have the ear of the, of, uh, of the leaders. 
but uh, they don't. They don't really. Uh, they're played along. We've been, the Jews have been played along. We've been played along. And we need to make sure that uh, we uh, understand that uh, during that time, that nothing was, nothing, we couldn't have any, as much influence as, as we wanted. But things have changed now. Why? Because it's now the country of Israel. Israel is an ally, quote unquote. Israel has some power. Israel has some influence. Israel is an important part of the world. And uh, it, it does give Jews here in America a little bit more, a little bit more clout because uh, they, because not only is there a Jewish community in Israel, but there's a community here in America and they're very much linked. I'm not sure about the next generation, but I know our generation still is very linked uh, to Israel. So uh, I, what I wanted to do tonight was just get your, whet your appetite to understand what in fact is going on during that time, to learn more of the history. I mean, this book is, uh, what is it? Is 300, close to 400 pages with notes. I haven't gone through a third of what, uh, what I learned here. And, but it's just hard to, to say it all. In fact, it was hard to read the book. I couldn't continue reading it. I had to put it down. Every, you know, I, I couldn't read it straight through or, you know, over a couple of nights, I had to put it down, then pick it up again a, a week later and pick it up again a week later because it was so upsetting to me to know what happened. I, I'm sure people in, in, who are listening now, I think most people have somebody who they lost during the war. I lost people during the war. I lost a brother and sister during the war. I lost I, uncles and aunts and cousins, as most people did. And it's a, it was very hurtful when I was reading it to see that maybe something more could have been done, but it wasn't. So I think we can learn from that, that we have to understand that uh, if, if he would have, if he would have uh, made more of a noise, Maybe there would have been a little bit of a rise of anti-Semitism in, in America, but maybe he would have been able to save another 100,000 Jews. Maybe, another, you know, maybe they would have bombed uh, the, uh, the, railroad, the railroad lines or the, uh, the bridges. Maybe they, maybe they would have done something. Maybe they would have warned, uh, what is it, uh, Hitler earlier that, yes, we, we will take Jews in. Don't think that they're not you know, they're, uh, they're non-persons, they're people, but that isn't what happened because the anti-Semitism is there already. So they shouldn't have, I don't know, they should have feared if more than do that. So I, I, what I like people to do is read this because uh, they, not only did he, I just scratched the surface, uh, the thing that I didn't go into much about was something that Medoff found was he has a lot more reason to believe that uh, that he was that FDR was actually more anti-Semitic than we than me. That fed into it. So that's something that I hope people will think about when they read this, when they look at this book. Again, it's not a, a pleasure book, and it's not. Unfortunately, it's not fiction. And so I think you know that's what I'd like people to get out of our discussion today. Any questions? Now, can can I react a little bit, if I may? Please. please. Uh, the name is Mike Kranzler. I grew up during that period. Uh, my parents, we fled from Germany in 1938. And uh, like all other parents, we all were enamored of FDR for a long time. And then all of a sudden, the, 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 the broke open, like you said, and people began to realize that he was not a friend of ours. First of all, Stephen Wise was a very close friend of the president. That's why he never, never opened up the mouth. And in fact, they had a big problem until they actually got through to Morgenthau. Morgenthau, who was the secretary treasurer, was the one who, who actually opened up the door to get some of the things done, uh, like the NRA, like the, uh, the war board, et cetera. Right, right. And, uh, and, he, and he also helped the, 
about it, at that time they started the Bat Hatzalah. The, the rabbis who came, they were organized in New York by Irving Bunim. There's several hundred rabbonim who came. They met with Morgenthau because they couldn't get to see Roosevelt. So he was the really the only one who of the government who really helped them out. And the Bat Hatzalah saved thousands of Jews as a result of that. Mm-hmm. So, and this is a whole history of the Orthodox Jews, what they accomplished during the war. In fact, my brother wrote several books on that, on the on the Hatzalah and how the Orthodox community reacted during this period. But what you described is something that we all lived through, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, it's the brand I trust. As much as life has changed over the last year, you're still pretty busy. David, you raised your hand. Who is talking in the background? Someone should be a host. They can... There is another conference going on? No, there are people talking, which they shouldn't be. No. Thank you very much. I think the, the, the report was very interesting, and I will suggest this book to my son-in-law and I'm sure he will be interesting, interested to read it. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Comments? Thank you. Thank you, Yashikawa. Very well done. Again, as everybody signs off, just remember.